there is a legal claim on your life. In fact, all God's people must die. This is what the Israelites were told by the Persian king, by decree, by law of the Persian king. The story begins with the grand banquet put on by the Persian king Xerxes in the third year of his reign for all of his nobles and officials. And this wasn't just any celebration or banquet or party or dinner party, but this celebration lasted 180 days. That's almost six months, half a year, that the king has put on this celebration to show off his power, to show off his wealth, to show off his majesty. And not only that, he had a second banquet to follow this banquet, because why not? So he had a shorter but much more extravagant banquet for all the people in the citadel of Susa. And this banquet lasted seven days. The Persian queen Vashti had a banquet of her own for all the women in the royal palace at the same time. And the king Xerxes, he sent for a queen for um, Queen Vashti to come to his banquet because he wanted to show off her beauty to everyone. But Queen Vashti refused. Now, after all this time and money and effort, six months plus a whole week put on top of it, all to show how powerful and mighty and wealthy the king was, and now his own wife won't listen to his command. So King Xerxes was pretty mad. And he sought the advice of his experts of the law. And under their misguided counsel, King Xerxes, in his rage, decreed a law that Queen Vashti was never again to enter into his presence. Seems like a little bit of an overreaction, right? I can see all of your faces. What? But yeah, a legal decree. And Persian law could not be changed. He could not change his mind the next day and allow her into his presence. The law was the law, and she could no longer enter his presence. So now the king needed a queen. So a search was made for all the beautiful young women to be brought before the king. And after a year long of beauty treatments and preparation, only then could these women be brought before the king. And then he would have his pick to choose who he wanted to replace Queen Vashti. And among these young women was a Jew named Hadassah. And Hadassah's parents had died, but she had been brought in and taken care of by her, by her cousin who treated her as his own daughter. But he warned Hadassah not to reveal her identity as a Jew. He told her not to tell anyone who she was. So she went by the more Persian name and the name that you, not, you might know her as, Esther. And Esther won the favor and approval of the king. So in the seventh year of his reign, he made her queen and, of course, threw a mighty banquet to celebrate. And so begins our message today on the book of Esther. Sometime later, the king promoted a man named Haman, who is um, an Agagite, over all the other nobles, officially making him the most powerful official in the entire empire. And the king commanded that all other officials must bow before him in respect any time he passed by. But Esther's cousin, Mordecai, refused to bow. And this infuriated Haman. There's already bad blood between Haman and Mordecai because of a deep-rooted hate in their family history. Haman is a descendant of the Amalekites, whereas uh, Mordecai is a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin. And to say the least, hate runs deep between these two peoples. So when, when Haman found out Mordecai's heritage, he set out to plot his revenge. And now the king kicking out his queen for not coming to dinner is going to seem like nothing compared to Haman's plot. Haman was not content to just punish Mordecai for not bowing down. He didn't want to just kill him or even just kill the whole tribe of Benjamin. No, Haman wanted to destroy the entire race of the Jewish people in all the empire, young and old. So lots were cast to determine the day of destruction. And now all that was left for Haman to do was ask the king's permission to go destroy all these people. And Haman was given all the power and authority he needed to do whatever he wanted with these people. Esther 3, 
Verse 13 says, dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the orders that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. And this was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. And the property of the Jews would be given to all those who killed them. When reading through the book of Esther, I immediately saw this connection here between Haman's plot to destroy the Jews and the devil's plot to destroy all people. John 10.10 10 says the purpose, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Haman's decree stripped the Jews of all of their possessions and it called to destroy and annihilate them. Haman was going to steal from, kill, and destroy all of God's people. And likewise, the devil is not content to just see God's people suffer. His purposes are to steal and kill and destroy. And like Haman, the enemy has the full power and authority to do so. Romans 6, 20, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through, Je through Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we come under the protection of Jesus, whose purpose is to give a rich and satisfying life, the enemy's plans cannot succeed. Joseph, could you bring me my water, please? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no one saw that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the decree was sent out for the destruction of the Jews into all the different cities, into all the provinces of the empire, in everyone's own language, so everyone could understand and know what was about to happen. And Esther's cousin Mordecai, he heard about this, and he was just sobbing, wailing loudly, crying through the streets, crying at the gates of the palace. He tore his clothes. And Esther's servants told her what was going on. And so she was, she was completely distraught. She's like, what is wrong with my cousin Mordecai? It seems Esther doesn't even know about this plot yet. And so she sends her cousin Mordecai clothes because he's, he's torn all his clothes. She doesn't know what to do, so she sends him clothes to help but Mordecai refuses to take it. So Esther then sends one of the king's eunuchs to ask Mordecai, what's wrong, what's going on? And Mordecai tells him everything that had happened. And instructed Esther to go before the king and beg for mercy for their people. But Esther told him if she were to go before the king uninvited, she would die unless the king held out his gold scepter to her and granted her mercy. But she hadn't been called to the king in 30 days. Now the king and Queen Esther, they've been married for a while. She was made queen in the seventh year of his reign, and now it's around the twelfth year of his reign. So they've been married for a while, and it's been nearly a month since the king has called her. So she's thinking, well, maybe my favor with the king has diminished. And maybe if I do go before the king right now, he won't grant me the same favor that I knew before, and I'll die. Esther has some real things to fear here. But verse 13 through 14 says, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. And who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. And Esther replied in verse 16. She said, go and gather all the Jews of Susa and, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. If Esther went before the king uninvited, she would likely die. That was the law. 
And let's not forget that this is the same king who banished his last queen for not coming to dinner when he asked. He felt so disrespected by that, he banished her. So what sort of disrespect could he expect when Esther comes before him uninvited? This is a real threat on Esther's life. Esther, who was once just a face in the crowd, has now been elevated to a position of authority and power. She's no longer Hadassah, but Queen Esther. And hidden under her secret identity, she holds the key to the salvation for God's people. Did you know you hold a key too? As God's people, we carry with us the truth of God's word, the truth of our need for salvation, and the truth of our Savior Jesus. If you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you have been elevated to a high position of authority and power, just like Esther. We are on a mission to see lost people saved. And perhaps you've been living with a secret identity like Esther. You're a Christian, but it's not really something you're outspoken about. It's not really something that you share with others. It's a hidden identity that you keep inside. And perhaps your hidden identity will serve you for a time, but just like Esther's, if you keep your identity hidden, people will die. That is the weight of Esther's mission. If she keeps quiet, her people will die. And it is the same weight of our mission. If we keep quiet about the truth of Jesus Christ as our Savior, people will die. Our mission is not about filling the seats in this church. Our mission is about filling the kingdom of heaven, about saving souls. But you know, the enemy has his own mission, to steal and kill and destroy. But God has come to give eternal life, and that is the truth of the Bible that needs to be shared. That is our mission. So on the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered into the inner courts of the palace, putting her life at risk. Esther had no idea what was going to happen. If you know the story, you know what happens. But just put yourself in her shoes for a second. She's entering into this room, and she doesn't know if she's going to leave, dead or alive. But she enters in anyways. We can't know in advance what our commitment to the mission is going to cost us. But Esther does not equate commitment with foolhardy risk. She goes before the king prepared. She has a plan in place. Esther has come dressed for the occasion. She has prepared internally, praying, fasting, and externally she's clothed herself in her royal robes. And we need to use the same wisdom as Esther to prepare internally by praying, getting our hearts right with God, and externally by clothing ourselves in the armor of God so that we can step into the mission that he has for us, not foolhardy risking our faith, not foolhardy risking our life, but saying, God, I'm committed to your mission, I have prepared for your mission, and I will follow where you lead me. And if I die, I die. That is what Esther says. So Esther enters the court. And the king who's sitting on his throne sees her. And I can just imagine the tension of the moment. Esther's waiting for what he's going to do. And maybe the king's like, what's Esther doing here? We don't know. <laughs> but the king welcomes her, and he holds out his golden scepter to her. So she approaches, and the king asks her, Queen Esther, what is it that you want? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Oh, great, this is perfect timing. The king's in a good mood. He's offered me half the kingdom. This is great. But Esther doesn't ask him then. Instead, she says, she invites him and Haman, what, to a banquet that night that she has prepared for the king. And so the king sends for Haman, and they attend Esther's banquet They've eaten, they're drinking, they're feeling good. The king's happy, and he asks Esther again, Queen Esther, what is it that you want? What is your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Another great opportunity. Come on, Esther, let's do this. But again, Esther says, 
Would you come to another banquet tomorrow with Haman? And then I promise I will explain what this is all about. You might hear this and be a little frustrated or maybe even a little annoyed with Esther. You're like, come on, Esther, you've missed two perfectly good opportunities to ask for the king's help. Like, what are you doing here? Are you just afraid? But no, Esther is exercising wisdom. And wisdom is not just about knowing how to present oneself. It's about knowing when and what to say. And Esther was sensitive to the importance of timing. And I didn't have a chance to go through the entire book of Esther, but there's a lot of important things that had Esther not waited, I think I'm okay for now, had Esther not waited, the timing wouldn't have been right. So Esther was sensitive to the importance of timing. So it's the second banquet. The king and Haman are attending. And again, the king asks Esther, Esther, what is it you want? I'll give it to you even if it's half the kingdom. And Esther says in chapter 7, verse 3, If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. And the Bible says that the, the king was shocked, which implies that the king didn't really understand the plan that Haman had presented to him. He didn't understand who these people were. He didn't understand what authority and power he was giving to Haman. He was shocked. And so he asks Esther, who would dare do such a thing? He can't even recall to mind what had happened previously with Haman. And Esther tells him, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Now, can you imagine this moment? Haman's sitting at the dinner table with the king and queen, and he's like, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> so the Bible says that Haman is terrified, and the king storms out in a rage. So now Haman's left alone with the queen, and he begs her for his life, throwing himself upon her. When the king reenters the room and sees Haman throwing himself on the queen, he has him killed. So this seems like a nice ending to the story, right? Haman's been killed. All is good. The enemy is defeated. Yes. But although Haman has been defeated, the edict he created lived on. And it was illegally binding under Persian law. It could not be revoked and it could not be changed. The fact is, the wages of sin is death. That is the legally binding law. The wages of sin is death. And we can't save ourselves. The Jews, they could not save themselves from this edict. Under the penalty of sin, the enemy has a legally binding claim on your life. This sentence to death weighs on your family. It weighs on your friends, on your neighbors, on your colleagues. Everyone who does not know Jesus as their savior. And the story continues. The king gave Esther and Mordecai the power of his signet ring, which gave them the power to do whatever they wanted in the king's name. So they wrote a second edict under the authority of the king. And this decree said in, says in chapter 8, verse 11, the king's decree gave the Jews in every city authority to unite to defend their lives. They were allowed to kill slaughter and annihilate anyone of any nationality or province who might attack them or their children or their wives and to take the property of their enemies. And like Haman's decree, this one was copied, written in all the languages of the people and sent out so that everyone would know. The second decree allowed the Israelites the chance to fight in defense of their lives, but it had no power to save the Israelites unless they knew about it. If the decree was written and simply put in a drawer, or it was written and only told to a few people, or if it was written and then thrown in the fire, never to be seen again, it holds no power to save the lives of the Israelites. They need to know about the saving grace of this edict. And the same goes for the gospel. If the word goes unread, the truth of salvation is hidden. If people who are unsaved don't know what the Bible says about their salvation, about their need for salvation, they won't be saved. That's the mission, to share the truth of the gospel. And we can rejoice knowing that our enemy, like Haman, was defeated when Jesus died on the cross. But the legal claim to your life still stands a 
until you accept Jesus as your Savior. Chapter 9 goes on to say, So on March 7th, the two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews that had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them, but no one could make a stand against them, for everyone was afraid of them. And that is the grace of God. When the day comes that the enemy has planned to steal, kill, and destroy lives, he will not be successful because of the gospel and the truth that we have shared. And by the favor of the king, the second edict was extended to a whole nother day. And I want to be clear about this. It wasn't extended so that the Israelites would have freedom to go out and kill whoever. The edict said that they had the freedom to protect themselves against people who would try to attack them. This is all about self-defense. So the edict was extended another day. And in total, the Jews gained relief from their enemies, killing 75,000 of those who hated them. They were not liked in Persia. 75,000 of their enemies were killed. And now it makes sense why Mordecai told Esther, or told Hadassah, not to tell people who she was. He feared for her life because there was a real threat in the kingdom for their people. But now every year, the festival of Purim is celebrated to remember the Jews' victory over their enemies. And it's called Purim because that's the name for casting lots, determining the day that, that it was set to be on March 7th. So they celebrate the festival of Purim. Esther is the only book of the Bible that does not mention God by name. The only one. But it's so evident you can see God's providential care working throughout the entire story. The favor that Esther gains at the beginning with the king, her favor when she enters into the courts, and all different parts of the story that I didn't get to share, God's presence is there with her. And Esther finds favor because she made God's priorities her priority. When we align with the unshakable kingdom, we too will never be shaken. Before going to the king, Esther stated, if I must die, I must die. Have you ever had that level of commitment to God's mission? I don't even know if I have. And she's not just saying it. She steps into the throne room and she risks her life. And she does it saying, if I must die, I must die. What if you are where you are, in the job that you're in, in the Uber that you're in, in the neighborhood that you live in, for such a time as this? There are those that need salvation. And I want to be Mordecai for you today. I want to encourage you to use your high position of authority and power. Not because you're on a platform or not because you have authority over people, but because you carry the authority of God within you. You carry the authority of truth, of God's word within you. That is the authority and power that you carry. It is not your own. We cannot save people by our own power and authority. It is by the power and authority of God that people are saved, and only by his grace. If you believe in Jesus, you're saved. But how many people are you bringing with you into God's kingdom? How many people are you leaving behind? So today, I want to challenge you to step out into the throne room. Maybe to take some risk, not foolhardy risk. Not risking all for faith, just to risk it all. Not gambling, but stepping out in faith when called by God to stand firm in his unshakable kingdom, in the unshakable truth, in the knowledge of Jesus as our savior. And if you wanna do that today, I wanna pray over you. 
I wanna pray that God would give you the wisdom that Esther had to know the right timing, that God would even give you the courage. You know, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage doesn't exist unless you're a little afraid. You can't be courageous if there's nothing to be afraid of. It's going to be scary. Esther was scared, but she was also courageous. She stepped out anyways. So every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you feel like this message has touched your heart today, you feel like maybe I've been living with a secret identity as a Christian. I didn't realize I was. I wasn't necessarily hiding it but I also wasn't sharing it with people. If you feel like maybe that's been you and you wanna make a change today, you wanna say, God, I wanna be used for your purpose, for your mission, Lord. I wanna step out in faith and confidence with courage, Lord, and I wanna see people saved, be Lord, because that is your mission, Lord, and I wanna align my mission with your mission, God. If that's you today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just raise your hand for me? That's so awesome. Now go ahead and put your hands down. Everyone can open their eyes. Now for those of you that raised your hand or the ones that wish they would, I'm gonna ask you to do something that's gonna make you feel uncomfortable. Esther had to step out in the throne room and it probably felt a little uncomfortable. I'm gonna ask you to come forward and I'm gonna pray over you up here. Just as a symbolic act, go ahead, a symbolic act as Esther walked into the throne room, she came forward before the king. I want you to come forward before the king of kings, not before me, but before God, and say, Lord, I am here for your mission, I'm here for your will, for your purposes, Lord. Use me in whatever way, and if I die, I die, Lord, use me. That is so awesome. I wanna see our whole church up here because this is our mission. This is the church's mission. This isn't Pastor Garen's mission. This isn't Pastor Shelley's mission. This isn't even my mission. This is God's mission, that we would see every single person in the city of Auburn saved. We wouldn't just see them well. We wouldn't just see them clothed and fed. We would see them when we die and we're in the kingdom of heaven. We would be able to look across and say, you're here because I saw you on the street and I stopped and I talked to you. How many people in the kingdom of heaven are gonna come up to you and say, I'm here because of you, thank you. I wouldn't be here without you. How many people? So I'm gonna pray over you. We just have every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I just thank you, God, for the courage that you have already given each and every person up here, God, and I'm up here too, Lord. I wanna be used by you. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom, God, to know the right things to say, how to say it, God, but also the perfect timing, God. Give us your wisdom, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to prepare in advance, Lord, that we wouldn't just make foolhardy risks, we wouldn't just sacrifice our job for no reason, Lord, but that we would be sensitive to the call of your voice, sensitive to your guiding, Lord. Give us wisdom, Lord to know what to do, Lord. Clothe us in the armor of God, Lord, that we may enter into the battle protected and surrounded by you, Lord. And God, we all here, Lord, we surrender our lives to you, God. We want our mission, our purpose to be your mission, God. Your mission to see people saved, Lord. Your mission to bring people into the kingdom of heaven, God. So we surrender it all to you today, today God. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Go ahead and take a seat. There's one final prayer. We don't let a single service go by without inviting you to put your faith in Jesus. You know, living without Jesus is like living under a legal claim on your life, a warrant out for your death. And it seems harsh, but it's the reality. And like I said before, the wages of sin is death, and we have all sinned and fallen short. So how do you escape this first edict? How are you saved? By the grace of God, there is a new law. The new law says that whoever believes in him, in Jesus, will not perish, but have eternal life in Jesus. So how do you become a Christian? By turning away from your sin, all those things that have separated you from God, that have kept you from him, 
and turning your life over to Jesus and letting him lead. And if you want to do that today, I invite you to be brave, to be courageous, and join, join the mission. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you today, if you say, you know, I, I haven't been living for God, I've been separated from him, I've been living in my sin, and today I choose, I want to turn from my sin and turn over to Jesus. If that's you, would you just raise your hand for me? I want to pray for you. Amen. Go ahead and put your hand down. With every eye closed, everyone, every head bowed, would everyone stand with me? And let's pray this prayer together, out loud. And if you're praying this prayer for the first time, I want you to pray it to Jesus. Would everyone repeat after me? Say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge that I am a sitter in need of a savior. So please forgive me of my sins and make me new. I choose to follow you starting now in Jesus' name. Can we just get a shout of praise for that? There are, there are more, king, more people in the kingdom of heaven now and we wanna see more, right? So let's be courageous in our mission. Thanks, Pastor Tori. I love how you just read that. You, you said that the enemy has come, has come to steal and kill and destroy. He's got plans against mm -hmm. us all. But God has come to give us a rich and satisfying life. Yeah. And just like Amen. Pastor Tori was saying, there are people in this room, people online, who have inherited that life mm -hmm. for the first time today. Amen. And that's something worth praising yeah. God for. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And if you did pray that prayer for the first time or you're recommitting your life to the Lord, will you just let us know by filling out on that Connect card, there's a place that says, I committed to follow Jesus today for the first time. Please let us know so that we can walk alongside you in that journey, which is being a Christian. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, the ushers are going to come down the aisles and collect those Connect cards. And as for everyone else, we will see you all next week. God bless you. We love you. Woo!